Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation at this year's Precise workshop. My name is David Schneider and I'm part of the Precise team here in Stuttgart. My work focuses mainly on data mapping methods and that's why I would like to talk about data mapping methods in Precise. To start off, I would like to give some motivational background why we actually need data mapping methods in Precise or in coupled simulation in general. So let's consider the case where we want to solve a global system in a partitioned way. We have two solver instances, for example, solver A and solver B, and we want to couple them together via a coupling interface in the middle. The coupling interface mesh is in precise solely defined through the vertex location. So from the precise perspective, the following setup would look like this. We have each individual solver defining an individual coupling mesh. And as we can see in this example, these coupling measures are non-matching at the common coupling interface. And the reason for this non-matching interface measures are different. So we might face different discretizations in each solver. We might face different geometries or just different mesh resolutions as in this example. But in the end, this requires always that we apply uh, data mapping methods in order to transfer the data accurately between the individual solvers. A complete overview of all available data mapping methods has recently been published in our new reference paper. The data mapping methods in Precise can be categorized roughly in two categories. We have projection-based data mapping methods, which are nearest projection and nearest neighbor mapping, and we have radial basis function data mappings, which can be distinguished according to compactly supported RBFs and global RBFs. In the following, I would like to show some of the results published in the reference paper and comment on the findings therein. But before doing so, I would like to recap each individual mapping method briefly and explain how it works. The most simple and probably most intuitive mapping method in Precise is probably the nearest neighbor mapping. Here, Precise compares solely the vertex location of each individual input vertex and output vertex, and the mapping then assigns simply the spatially nearest neighbor of each input vertex to the output vertex. It's among all available data mapping methods by far the most efficient and most robust choice, but it only delivers first order accuracy. A more advanced option is given by the so-called nearest projection mapping. The nearest projection mapping is essentially a two-step procedure, where we first compute an interpolation to a projection node, and afterwards we perform an extrapolation in normal direction to the desired location on our output mesh. The first step, the interpolation, requires additional connectivity information from the user to Precise. So we would need to tell Precise which vertices are actually located next to which other vertices. In our example here, we have the definition of an edge uh, connecting the blue sphere here and the blue sphere here. Combining several edges, one can also then define triangles and quadrilaterals. Using this precess that can then perform the weighted interpolation to the projection node, which is mostly of second order, and a first order extrapolation in normal direction. Therefore, the global behavior of our nearest projection mapping is case dependent. If our interface meshes match very well geometry wise, then we can mostly benefit from the second order interpolation scheme because our first order extrapolation error is negligible. If, however, our geometries do not match very well at the interface, then we might fall back to a first order scheme. The third mapping option in Precise is using radial basis function data mappings. And the conceptual idea of RBF mappings is shown in this figure. So we have again our input mesh vertices um, illustrated by blue spheres. And now, in order to compute our RBF mapping, we place in each of this input mesh vertices a radially symmetric basis function, for example, a Gaussian. And in order to evaluate the RBF mapping, we simply use a linear combination of all basis functions. So we sum up all the basis function. And the result is indicated here by the black straight line. For example, if we want to evaluate the value of our RBF mapping at this exemplary orange sphere or at this particular uh, output mesh vertex, we would get this value. And the advantage of this mapping method is clearly that it's uh, higher order accurate, so it depends a bit on the selected basis function, but we, mostly we get at least second order accuracy, 
but it's of course computational much more expensive compared to our projection-based data mapping methods. As stated before, we still need to distinguish between compactly supported RBFs and global RBFs. Compactly supported RBFs cover only a fixed amount of vertices and radial direction. And in precess terminology, this is uh, usually user-defined, and the user defines a so-called support radius. And if our uh, value or if our vertex, our, our nearest vertex is below this support radius threshold, then our radial basis function is non-zero, and if it's above the support radius, then our radial basis function is essentially zero. In contrast, global RBFs never get really zero, at least from a mathematical perspective, which means in particular that every vertex couples with every vertex. For RBFs, or in order to solve RBFs, one always needs to solve an interpolation matrix, which is of size n input vertices times n input vertices. For compactly supported RBFs, we finally retrieve a system of sparse or a system with a sparse matrix. And for a global RBF, we therefore get a system of a dense matrix, which is, of course, much more expensive to solve for. And the conceptual idea of compactly supported RBFs is also shown in the plot on the left. Here, we have a compactly supported thin plate spline function. And if we select our support radius smaller and smaller, so we want to cover less and less vertices in radial direction, our radial base function becomes more and more narrow. So this was a brief recap of our mapping methods as we have them in precise. And now we need to compare our mapping methods. And in order to compare them, we used, uh, in particular, a turbine blade geometry. So we use ASTE, which I will talk about a bit later. And then we selected an analytic test function. So in particular, we selected here a cosine function depending on all the three space dimensions. And we, then we selected a turbine blade geometry. And from this geometry, we then created meshes of different refinement levels. And in order to compare, for example, accuracy, we then fixed the output mesh and refined the input mesh on and on. And then we measured the error on the output mesh. But we also compared things like uh, the performance, the memory consumption, and the yeah, timings of our mapping methods. And First of all, let's take a look at the error measures of our mapping methods. So here we have on the y-axis um, the mapping error on a log scale, and on the x-axis we have the mesh width. So this means on the right side here we have very fine input meshes, and on the left side we have very coarse input meshes. First of all, we see that our nearest neighbor mapping uh, results in a nearly perfect match to our first order convergence slope up here, meaning that we get a nearly first order convergence behavior as we predicted it from the theoretic perspective. Also, we see that our global RBF mapping is uh, for the finest input mesh uh, the most accurate one, and we get at least second order accuracy, partially even a higher accuracy or a higher convergence order than second order. Then we also see that our compactly supported RBF uh, become more accurate if we increase the support radius. So we have once um, a line indicating a compactly supported RBF with R equals 20 H, meaning that we cover 20 vertices in radial direction, and we have R equals 3 H, meaning that we only cover three vertices in radial direction. We mostly get second order accuracy, but as we see, we get a much more accurate method when we increase the support radius, which, of, which is of course also what we would expect. The behavior of the nearest projection mapping is a bit mixed. So we see that for very coarse input meshes, our mapping method is dominated by the projection error we do when performing the extrapolation, as I explained before. Um, and we see if we refine our geometry, then the nearest projection mapping clearly outperforms the nearest neighbor mapping and the error behavior is mainly dominated by the interpolation scheme. If we take a closer look at the initial preparation time uh, required for the individual mapping methods, so this is now really a time only spent once for a mapping and not in every iteration when we move on in our simulation, the situation is essentially inverted. 
So we see that the global RBF mapping is by far the most expensive variant, and we see that the projection-based mapping methods are by far the most cheap variants. Uh, in between, we see that for a higher support radius, of course, our mapping becomes more and more expensive. If we take a closer look at the recurrent mapping time of the individual mapping methods, the situation looks a bit different. So the first thing we notice is that the projection-based data mapping methods do not appear in this plot anymore, which is due to the fact that they are below the measurement threshold of one millisecond. Uh, and we also see uh, that with a higher support radius, our mapping methods become also recurrently more expensive in each individual iteration. What's a bit counterintuitive in this plot is that our global RBF is partially cheaper than our compactly supported RBF methods. But this is uh, caused by the fact that we compare here a PETSI-based implementation, which uses an iterative GMRES solver, with an Eigen-based implementation, which uses a QR decomposition. So here we initially compute a QR factorization, which is very expensive. Um, but keep in mind that it's not only very expensive uh, due to the fact that we use a QR decomposition, but it's all also expensive uh, because we use here dense matrices. Um, but it's less expensive to evaluate later on in each individual time step. On the other hand, solving the GMRS system in each individual iteration is comparatively expensive, but as I said, we have then sparse matrices which require much less memory and which are much easier to handle. So to summarize our results so far, we have our nearest neighbor mapping method with a first order accuracy and a low computational cost, and our nearest projection mapping with either second or first order convergence behavior and also a very low computational cost. But still, the user needs to define connectivity uh, in order to apply this mapping. Then we have our compactly supported RBFs, which have mostly second order accuracy and yeah, uh, medium computational cost. But I mean, in the end, the computational de cost depends here highly on the support radius selected. So if we select higher support ready, um, the computational cost might as well be high. And if we select a, select a very low uh, support radius, our computational cost might also be very low. And then we have global RBF uh, mappings, which have also a second order or even higher convergence behavior, but also a very high computational cost. Another thing I would like to comment on is how does the situation look like for volume coupling? Until now, we only looked at surface coupling. And for volume coupling, the situation looks a bit different. So our nearest neighbor mapping is perfectly fine applicable because it's computationally very cheap and it's also very robust. But for example, our nearest projection mapping is not applicable at all because uh, it would require to define volume elements, so for the connectivity, and this is simply not implemented at the moment. Our RBF mappings are somewhat applicable, uh, but one runs quickly into a situation where these mapping methods are simply too expensive. In particular, our global RBF mapping is mostly too expensive and for the compactly supported RBF it highly depends on the specific case, on the desired accuracy or for example on the selected support radius. And in order to improve on this situation and provide more alternatives in the future we are currently investigating new mapping methods. And one of these new mapping methods is in particular the nearest neighbor gradient data mapping method. The conceptual idea of the nearest neighbor gradient mapping is illustrated in this figure. So we have again the blue sphere indicating our input mesh vertex and the orange sphere indicating our output mesh vertex. And the mapping then assigns the input mesh vertex to the output mesh vertex, so again the spatially nearest neighbor, just as we did it for the nearest neighbor mapping. But we additionally take the spatial derivative of our input data into account in order to reconstruct an improved interpolant on our output mesh. And the overall idea is then that we combine the low computational cost of the nearest neighbor search, just as we had it for the nearest neighbor mapping, with a higher convergence scheme. And from the user perspective, the gradient data is usually much easier to provide than the connectivity data. Consider, for example, the case of a finite element discretization. 
computing gradient data in our quadrature points, which we might use for the coupling process, um, is very easy because we can simply compute the derivatives on our shape functions. But defining connectivity between individual quadrature points is very tedious, especially across element boundaries. Another method we are recently investigating is the so-called partition of unity approach. And the conceptual idea is again illustrated on the right here. So given some data distribution here in, in red, we split our domain into some mildly overlapping subregions illustrated by the blue circles here. And now we uh, associate to each of these circles a compactly supported function, so a weighting function, and the only restriction is that this function is equal to 1 if we sum over all subdomains in every point. So for example here uh, at this red sphere one would get for the weighting function always equals to 1 if one sums up the weight of this subdomain and of this subdomain. And now we construct in each of these subdomains a local approximant and we would preferably use here an RBF mapping again and in order to retrieve then the global approximant, one can simply uh, multiply the local approximant times the weight and sum over all involved subregions. And one might wonder where is now the difference towards uh, local RBF methods or compactly supported RBF methods, but the main difference is that the partition of unity approach is really a local method uh, in the sense that we don't need to solve a global system at all, because here computing the local approximant is entirely a local operation and uh, if we compute the approximants in overlapping regions we solely need to take uh, the overlapping regions into account so all involved regions whereas for the compactly supported rbf systems we still solve a global system and in theory uh, the partition of unity approach inherits the convergence property of the uh, local approximant used within the subregions and we don't know yet for sure, but we would hope that we get something which is of lower computational cost with the same convergence properties, uh, which is then also applicable, for example, to volume coupling or to large cases in general. In the remaining part of my presentation, I would like to answer the question how we actually investigate data mappings in Precise. And the problem is a bit that data transfer to and from Precise is a bit challenging in the sense that Precise is a library and you usually need different solvers to call precise in order to perform a mapping. And the way we did this for the reference paper and the results we've seen so far is we used ASTA for this purpose. So ASTA is an acronym for Artificial Solver Testing Environment and it's essentially a shallow wrapper around the precise API which allows you to call the precise API functions and imitate solver behavior. And in addition to this precise uh, Asta also allows you to generate and store data in mesh files. For example, consider the uh, cosine function we've seen before. We could evaluate this function on a mesh and store uh, the data immediately in this mesh file. Uh, we can also compute errors on mesh files, for example, against some data we already have stored in our mesh files. And of course, we can execute precise in parallel, which is then the imitation of a specific solver behavior. And so far, Asta was mainly a developer tool and used by people developing in and around Precise. But in the future, we would like to make Asta really a user tool. And for this, we have the following three use cases in mind. So the first one would be studying mapping methods on arbitrary meshes. This is what we've seen in this presentation and what we've done for the reference paper, for example. The second use case would be to reproduce a specific mapping setup of your coupled scenario. So using the export functionality of Precise, one can simply export the interface meshes and reload them later into Asta. Then one can simply, for example, play around with a mapping configuration or compare accuracies. The third use case would be to replace a participant in a coupled simulation using Asta. So the idea is that you first execute your coupled simulation as usual, and then you export again the interface meshes using the export functionality of Precise and when executing it again you replace one participant by Asta and Asta then loads for each individual time step uh, the exported interface meshes 
and using this you can essentially replace one participant of your coupled setup and this might be helpful for example for adapter development for debugging of your coupled case um, if you want to run independent of one solver or it might just be much faster compared to running the actual simulation and in order, in order to give you an idea of how the interface of Aster looks like at the moment, I would like to show you a brief demo. So in this directory, I prepared a small example case, which consists of a coarse turbine mesh geometry and a very fine turbine mesh geometry. And of course, we have a precise configuration file uh, for our coupled simulation. And the precise config is actually very basic. We have a three dimensional setup. We have two meshes, mesh A and mesh B, and two participants, participant A and participant B. And we execute a simple nearest neighbor mapping in this example. Our time stepping is also very simple. We essentially just ex uh, execute a sim single time step. So we specify a maximum time value of one and a time window size of one. And the first thing we need to consider now is which data do we actually want to map between these meshes because the meshes are essentially empty. And for this purpose, we have a tool which is called Aster Evaluate. And if we don't know how to deal with this tool, we can always ask for help, for help by typing in Aster Evaluate minus minus help. And this gives us a list of all available command line arguments for this tool. So we have, for example, a mesh argument defining our input mesh uh, we can specify a function which will be evaluated on the mesh and stored under a specific data name. We can also list available functions. So there are common mapping functions which can be used in order to investigate mappings. And we can also specify an output argument if we, for example, want to store our data on a different mesh. So let's see how this looks like in a practical example. So first of all, I'm going to list the available functions. And what we see is that we have a def definition for Franke's function, for Eckholder function and the Rosenbock function. And we have each of this function in a 3D and in a 2D fashion. And now I would like to evaluate on the coarse mesh, which is our input mesh for this example case. Uh, uh, Franke's function, for example. So I type in here Franke 3D and I just call this data Franke. This should already be sufficient. And okay, so as the evaluate tells me that it evaluated actually the function on the coarse turbine mesh and saved it to the Franke variable name. And we can actually also go ahead and visualize this now in Paraview. So we have the coarse turbine mesh geometry and going to Paraview, we actually see, all right, we have our turbine mesh geometry and Franke's function. So this seems to work. And now we need to feed in this data to precise. And in order to do this, we have a tool called Aster Run. And again, we can ask for help and here we see that we essentially need to provide a participant argument. So we need to tell uh, us the which participant we want to run. Then we need to provide a data argument. So this is essentially the data we just generated. So we ask us to, to pick up this data. Then we need to provide a mesh argument. Uh, so we want to select as an input mesh the cause turbine mesh and note that this is only the mesh prefix so Aster will automatically pick up the correct mesh and this should already be sufficient in order to execute the first participant. All right precise is waiting for the other participant and I split my terminal and open another session now and will execute the second participant. So we have now participant BE which is supposed to pick up the fine turbine mesh. And the data argument is now a bit different because we need to specify essentially the name of our map data. So maybe we call it mapped Franke. And we need to specify an output argument. So 
a mesh on which the generated data is supposed to be stored. So let's call it uh, resulting mesh. Let's execute this and we see, okay, our coupled simulation runs through and we can also see in our directory, okay, we have some precise logging and some precise JSON files as we yeah, usually get them in any coupled simulation. And now we can also go ahead and visualize the resulting mesh .vtk, which was the data now generated by our uh, Aster tool. And what we see is we have our map Frankes function. So if you remember the last figure, uh, the function looked uh, similar qualitatively, but we see already that we have a much finer geometry and um, the function is not smooth in this region, for example. But if we want to assess now the quality of our mapping, we can again use our Aster Evaluate tool because, again, typing here Aster Evaluate minus minus help, we can uh, use the, the so called diff lag in order to calculate the, different, uh, the difference of individual data sets uh, with respect to certain functions. So I will just show you it because it's probably much easier to understand this when seeing the actual procedure. So we have us to evaluate and now we have of course our mesh argument being the result mesh .vtk file and now as I said I would like to run us to evaluate in diff mode in order to compute the error on this mesh. So I have minus minus diff and then I need to spe specify a difference data. This was Franke, no it was mapped Franke. And we need to specify the function as the supposed to compare this data against. So this was Franke 3D. Then we also can specify again a data argument. So which name uh, should we give the data generated? So this is just the error data. And I guess this should already be fine. Let's see. No, it says unrecognized argument. Yeah, it's not different. It's actually diff data. Yes, and this works. And what it gives us now is some error measures. So we have a relative L2 error. We have a maximum and minimum error. And we have uh, the new gen newly generated error data. And if I go now ahead, for example, and visualize it in Paraview, so I have a the resulting mesh.vtk, uh, we would see that we also have this error data and we can, for example, see the region down here where we also already visualize, uh, visually could see that the data is not smooth. We can see that our mapping is performing not that great. And using this information, one can go ahead and try out different mapping setups, uh, compare accuracy, one can also use the timings framework of precise in order to compare the performance of individual mapping setups. And of course, as I explained already on the slides before, one can also go ahead and just exchange this artificial geometry by his own setup uh, when combining it, for example, with the export functionality of precise. And with this, we hope to provide something useful in the future. And if you have any suggestions or any ideas already in mind, Feel free to contact us. Uh, with this, I would also like to finish my brief demo. If you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. And thank you very much for your attention.